There's a really important part of this. To an extent that immunologists and psychologists rarely appreciate, we are architects of our own experience. This is the sentence, though. Your subjective experience carries more power than your objective situation. Basically, it says what you perceive uh, in your uh, in your own uh, experience is more powerful than the real world in which you live. It, it is from a, an epigenetics researcher, UCLA professor of medicine, all that kind of stuff like that. Because basically, it's fully it's a full documentation of everything in the biology of belief. There was another study that just came out recently, I think less than a month ago, and it's making crazy waves on the internet. And they're talking about that actual memories, habits, and characteristics can carry over into the next generation. Well, uh, I've seen bits on that on a molecular level. I don't know what they're looking at in this because some, you know, we carry over well, some I think how they, genetics. I think how they did a study was in the habit. They had mice. Yeah. And they – we're doing uh, simplified psychology testing with like electrical shock. So the mice yeah. goes to the food, gets a shock, and they bred the mice up to five generations. And they're trying to see if that same type of, say, offspring up to the third generation will have the same instinctive reaction to that shock. And they found out that the mice who were exposed to food equals shock, they actually avoided food naturally throughout, I think it was the third or fourth type of, uh, third or fourth generation down the line. Uh huh. So they're well, pretty much they're pretty much saying that like your behaviors of what you do today will carry over to your grandchildren. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's epigenetics. Uh, and and what's relevant is your grandchildren don't have to live with that if they understand it because they can change the epigenetics. See, in the old days, if it was genes, okay, your genes carry over. You got the genes, you got the problem. You know, there's nothing you can do about it. Epigenetics is an adjustment of the reading, and you can adjust it yourself so you're not really a victim uh, when you understand it. If you don't understand it, uh, you are you uh, appear to be a victim of, oh, my God, I'm just, you know, fate is against me. And it's like, that's not true. <laughs> what do you think is one of the biggest dangers of today's time uh, for our uh, health? Uh, the biggest danger of today's time is the lack of a no of knowledge about how we operate uh, that the public ha has no awareness of. Uh, you, you know that phrase, knowledge is power. Everybody goes, yeah, and I go, you, you know, there's a more important take on it. It's like a lack of knowledge is a lack of power. And uh, the amazing lack of knowledge about how we work as biological organisms uh, is disempowering people because uh, people feel they're victims uh, of uh, genes, chromosomes, proteins, bugs, germs, whatever. And it's like, that is the farthest thing from the truth. They're, they, they are masters of it. But if they believe they're victims, then by definition, that belief will express itself. And that's what they, that's what they experience. I see something happening in the world right now. Maybe just me because I'm, I consider myself still very young. I'm only, tw I'm 29 actually this year is I see a kind of shift in consciousness happening globally speaking. I see more or less people slowly starting to wake up. Are you noticing that that same type of trend is happening? Not only am I noticing it, I'm really going out and doing most of my work these days and and helping people do that uh, because the evolution that we're talking about, number one, is not a physical evolution. It's a consciousness evolution. And number two, which is very critical about this, is that um, uh, it's based on being informed. And so, uh, and there's a need for this evolution. Let me ask you a question: Are, are we are we logging time? Yeah, we're or, we're logging time. This is all free flowing, baby. <laughs> oh, I, I I thought there was gonna be some formal thing. Okay, so <laughs> hello, formal people out there listening to me logging time here. <laughs> well, this is very critical because as Amir is talking about, indeed, there's a um, an evolution in front of us right now. I'll give you a simple fact: um, five times in the history of this planet, life was thriving and then instantly got wiped out, relatively instantly. And um, these were called mass extinctions. Five times this has happened where, you know, full life going and then boom, life seemed to get wiped out and the bits and pieces left over, restarted the whole thing again, built it up to a flourishing uh, biosphere, and then boom, it got lost again five times. Um, science has now made it a fact that we are now in the sixth mass extinction of life on this planet, that we are losing species of organisms faster than in any of the previous five mass extinctions. Uh, 
The relevance about today's mass extinction event, though, science has also recognized that while previous ones are attributed to things like comets or asteroids hitting the Earth and throwing the environment upside down, today's mass extinction is apparently uh, been uh, directly due to human behavior. Mm. That way we're living on this planet, the people, the way we treat the flora and fauna of the planet, the way we treat Mother Earth has been so destructive that we're undermining the web of life and uh, and we're seeing our own uh, initiation of a collapse and we're facing extinction. That's a real statement. This is not a million years from now. Uh, it's even just NASA just released a, a big scientific report that industrialized civilization will be totally crashed in the next few decades and it might be only two decades actually 20 years so we're not talking like you know generations away we're talking in your lifetime this world is going to go through some most amazing upheaval that people have ever experienced on this planet and if the outcome isn't decided it doesn't mean just because we're going to make an action we want to get there that we're going to you know stem the, the the tide here it doesn't seem to be uh in that favor right now it's like 50 50 the whole idea is this What's going to happen to the people here? And the people are going to have to learn something. The way we've been living is totally antagonistic to life and that uh, new behaviors are required. What's interesting is I wrote a book about this called Spontaneous Evolution, which is based on the biology of belief. Uh, biology of belief book uh, comes down to a very simple fact. The, the life we experience is, is not a coincidence or an accident, but we are participating in creating it and unfolding it. So we're, we're not just recipients of life. We're, we're manifestors, creators of life. That, and when you understand the biology of belief, you understand how you can use uh, your beliefs and issues like that to create the most wonderful life, healthy and happy and everything. As a matter of fact, the last book I just wrote is called The Honeymoon Effect. Uh, and it, it's a very interesting book because uh, basically what it says is this, no matter how crappy your life might be up to the moment you meet this one special person and, uh, you know, that person blows your mind and you're you know, falling in love head over heels and stuff like that. I say, up to the minute you fell in love, the moment you fell in love, your life changed. You got healthier. You had tremendous amounts of energy. You know, people made love for days without stopping for food or sleep. And life was so great that you couldn't wait to have the next day. That beginning love, that jolt, that really is amazing. And I call it the honeymoon effect. It turns out this is not an accident or coincidence. This is a personal manifestation. And the idea is if you understood how you manifested that honeymoon experience. And more importantly, understand why you lose that experience, then the obvious solution or conclusion is then you should be able to manifest a honeymoon experience every day of your life for as long as you live on this planet. This is absolutely true. And the, the reason why we don't have it uh, is really f uh, uh, fun in this regard is that most everybody's seen the movie The Matrix. Yeah. Uh, and if you go to the video store, you say, where's The Matrix? They go, oh, it's in the science fiction department. And I go, uh, wrong place. <laughs> <laughs> the, Matrix, the, the Matrix is a documentary. We have been programmed. And when you get out of the program, when you take that red pill, uh, there's another world right out there. And you're going to say, well, what do you mean? And I'm going to say, well, here's the point. That honeymoon experience that people get, and sometimes it lasts just for days and it may last a week or a month or something, and inevitably it seems to disappear, and there's a reason why. That honeymoon experience, science has now understood why we had that experience, how we got that experience. And, and here's what, the, what they found out. The Biology of Belief book talks about that our mind is creating our life. We have two aspects to our mind, the conscious mind, which is the one connected to you as a personal, unique individual. The conscious mind has your identity. It's a seed of your spirituality, your source. That's where you are, the conscious mind, a, a lobe of brain tissue right behind the cortex is the home base. The rest of the brain behind that is the equivalent of the subconscious. It was there before consciousness. And the subconscious mind is a, a, a sort of a reflex mind, stimulus response mind. Uh, it basically, animals live in an environment and the stimuli out there cause push the button and then they make responses. The conscious mind is creative mind. 
Uh, and so this is what separates humans from a lot of lower organisms is that not only do we react to the world around us, but we can create from our awareness. And then all of a sudden you see, look what we created. Uh, this came from the conscious mind's ability to create. Uh, and uh, as a creator mind, the creative mind, the conscious mind has your wishes and desires, you know. So I say, Amir, man, tell me, what do you want from your life? And whatever you offer as an answer, you have to recognize this is a creative answer because you're projecting into the future what you would like. It's not your life right now. It's like what I want. So that's a characteristic of the creative life. Uh, and also recognize this. The creative mind is the source of your wishes and your desires and your aspirations. So those things that you want from life are based in the conscious mind. The subconscious mind it's like a, a database where you push the, the button and it plays a program. It's habits, primarily habits. And so that uh, you, from your life experiences, you learn how to make a response or to do something. You don't have to relearn it every time if it repeats itself because if it's something that repeats itself, then by habit, you learn the program. It's downloaded as a program. It's push the button, play the program. So the conscious mind is creative. The subconscious mind is habitual, plays habits. Now, here's the issue and here's the... The problem that every one of us in the world, including myself, have to deal with and have to know about to be empowered to take your life. And that it goes like this. You, your wishes, desires, aspirations, function. The issue is that the conscious mind is also, and this is the, the where the monkey wrench is thrown in, the conscious mind can think. Hmm. Well, the point is the moment you're thinking, by definition, you're not paying attention. So in other words, uh, you don't stop everything you're doing when you have a thought. You're walking down the street, you have a thought, and all of a sudden you freeze, and you wait for the thought to clear, and then you get back engaged again. Uh, it's seamless. The moment the conscious mind is in thought, the behavior is by default controlled by the subconscious seamlessly. So whatever you were doing, you could be paying attention to it. Let's say your job, whatever it is you're doing on your job, you're having a thought. All of a sudden, your conscious mind goes up in the thought. You don't stop your job. You continue doing the job, but that's your job. That's your behavior. That's program that you know how to do that. And, and so basically it says, now here's the issue. 95% of the day, our conscious mind is thinking. Mm. It comes down to a very simple fact. You're only controlling your, your neurobiology, your cognitive uh, behavior. You're only controlling it 5% of the time with your wishes and your desires, your positive thoughts, your aspirations. 5% you're in control. The reason is 95% of the time you're thinking, so you went on to the automatic subconscious program. And then I go, and so what's wrong with that? And here's what's wrong with it. Analogy time again. Consider an iPod as the mind and that the uh, click wheel on the front, the wheel on the front is the conscious mind because you can make a creative playlist. It's creative. You can pick out what you want, push the button and play it. So the click wheel is the conscious mind. And uh, I say, okay, you get a brand new iPod, take it out of the box. And I say, okay, push play and nothing plays. And everybody looks at you like you idiot. You obviously didn't download any play anything. So now I go, interesting analogy for the simple reason. Consciousness is the ability to be creative. Consciousness without any data has no function. <laughs> if, you can't be, if there's no data to be conscious of, then consciousness doesn't have a role. So during our development, the first seven years of our lives, our brain function is predominantly, a, when you talk about EEG, electroencephalograph, putting wires on your head, our brain function is primarily in theta. That's a lower vibration than consciousness. Consciousness is alpha. So you're not really being conscious at this point. But it's interesting because you're participating in a world that theta is like imagination. And this is why children, especially between two and seven, are constantly mixing the real world and the imaginary world together uh, because their mind is operating at that frequency. But here's the other point. Theta is hypnosis. And so why is that relevant? It says the first seven years of your life is download, downloading programs of how to respond to life, how to behave, how to make relationships, how to do your job, how to have uh, uh, love for yourself or not to be loved for yourself or whatever. Who you are, programming comes in first seven years. How do you do it? You don't have to do anything. Your mind uh, is predominantly in theta. 
You observe your mother, your father, your family, your community. You observe them. There are things called mirror neurons in the brain that can take other people's behaviors and, and actually have you get a feeling and experience of it. So using the mirror neurons, you observe how your parents or your family, how they respond to the world, how they respond to each other. And what you're doing is not you're not putting any conscious effort into it. Conscious is not even working yet. You're downloading. And I say, well, why is that relevant? And I can, now we come tie, tie this thing in a circle. Your subconscious programs, your basic programs in life and how to deal with life are not from you. They're not from your wishes or your desires. They were programmed into you by your family and your culture and your community. And this becomes relevant because then when you default into the subconscious, the primary way you deal with life is not the way you would deal with life. It's the way that other people dealt with life. And so you're not even living your own life. And here comes then the, the second part of the same big problem. Because you play the default subconscious programs when your mind is thinking, then by definition, your consciousness rarely observes your subconscious behavior. Because it's only playing when your consciousness is thinking. And so uh, basically, then you're not seeing your own behavior. In, in lectures, Amir, I, I, um, I offer the audience uh, this, this scenario that most of them are familiar with, and they laugh about it. And I go, look, I'm sure you had a friend you grew up with. You knew your friend's behavior very, very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And at some point, you start to see that your friend has some of the same behavior as their parents. So you, you give a little volunteer thing. You go, hey, you know, Bill, you're just like your dad. It's at that moment that Bill looks at you and gets angry and says, how the hell can you compare me to my dad? And everyone laughs because there's some life experience that they recognize this. And, 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 and But I say, though, the story is profound. And why is it profound? Because of the point that I was talking about is illustrated, and that is this. Bill got his programming from his father. When he plays his father's program, which is in the subconscious mind, he's playing it because his conscious mind's busy. Therefore, he's the one that doesn't see the behavior. Everybody else sees the behavior. And that's where the problem comes from. 95% of the day, we're playing programs that are not coming from our wishes and desires that they were learning responding to other people and the significance is that only five percent of the time are we creating a life based on our wishes and desires and 95 percent of the time we're just replaying a life that has been programmed into us by other people and passed from family to family down generations and all of a sudden you realize you're not living your life <laughs> you're living a program and then and so the then the resolution put it back into the matrix is okay you're running in this program and you're and you're playing these behaviors that you don't see, and if they're not supportive, and psychology will tell you, seventy percent or more of these developmental programs are limiting, self uh, uh, sabotaging, disempowering. So it says seventy percent of your programs that you're not paying attention are sabotaging yourself, and you don't see it. Mm. And then all of a sudden you say, "Why is that relevant?" I go, "Well." I wake up in the morning with, I'm going out there to get a great job, and I'm going to find a great romance, and I'm going to be healthy. That's what I want. You come home, 5 o'clock, tail between your legs, dragging your ass in, going, geez, another day. I never got to where I was going. Uh, and then you have to look at it and say, well, what's the problem? The problem is, according to the way you just responded to life, it's not me. I had the great wishes and desires to be successful, and so I'm a victim of circumstances, the universe, fate, nature. I'm a victim because I wanted to have all these positive things and look what I ended up with. And then all of a sudden I say, yeah, but wait, you only were operating 5% of the time moving towards your positive destination. And 95% of the time you were playing self-sabotaging limiting programs that you didn't see. So all of a sudden it turns out we're not victims. We created the crap. <laughs> but we didn't have any awareness of it. We didn't know we were doing it. It's invisible. We didn't see it. And we didn't know that our behavior in those invisible periods were programmed by other people. And so tie it back in, last piece. Here, the matrix, you say, yeah, you take the red pill, you get out of the program. I say, and guess what? Science has recognized that when you fall head over heels in love, it's the same as taking the red pill mm. because when you fall head over heels in love, you don't let your conscious mind wander. 
it stays right up front. And you'd say, well, why? Why is it different? It wanders 95% of the day every other day, but today I'm in love and now my conscious mind's here it's staying here. And the answer is simple. The answer is everything you wanted is in front of your face. Why would you let your mind wander? Everything is right there. And guess what? Now you're operating from consciousness. Yeah, which guess what? Wishes and desires. And then two people simultaneously operating from their conscious minds, no programming, engaging wishes and desires. What do they manifest? Heaven on earth. And so, then all of a sudden you realize, oh my God, the, the matrix is right. The screw up in my life is the programming, not my wishes and desires. But I didn't see I was programmed and I didn't know that this was occurring 95% of the time. And when we start to understand this and recognize you can change the programming, then all of a sudden it says, how about it if you rewrote your subconscious programs and put in the wishes and desires as your programs instead of whatever you learn from your family and from school and your teachers and all that other crap that, that really threw junk into your head. What if you put all those wonderful things in your head? And, and then here's the secret solution when that happens. That when you're conscious, you're living your wishes and desires and your aspirations. You fall in love. You live heaven on earth because you're living your wishes and desires. And then I say, yeah, but if you change the program in your subconscious so that there are always uh, programs of wishes and desires, then that means whether you're paying attention or you're not paying attention, the same behavior that created heaven on earth. And and the issue, uh, which I should just step back here, one quick step back, is, uh, yes, I said how we fell in love, being conscious, being mindful, uh, uh, doesn't lead to using the subconscious default programs, which we got from other people. And this is called the honeymoon period where you and your partner are using your best behaviors, creating the best example of life you really want. Everything's beautiful. But then down the road, look, no matter how much love is wonderful, you still got to pay the rent. <laughs> you got to fix you got to fix the car. You got to do these things. I say, why is it relevant? The moment life gets busy and your mind starts thinking, uh, what happens? Oh, your conscious mind's thinking, you're now defaulting to subconscious programs. And I say, well, why is that relevant? So, so for example, I'm in a wonderful relationship with my partner, Margaret. She asked me this wonderful, simple question. I'm thinking about fixing a car. She asks this question. I turn around and go, blah, blah, blah. And she looks at me like, who are you? <laughs> Where'd that come from? <laughs> So let's look at the scenario. What happened? I was in my conscious mind thinking. She asked me a question. I responded to her the way my father perhaps responded to my mother. Mm. And now the, she looks at me and goes, who are you? And then you have to realize, I have no idea what the hell she's talking about. Why? I was in thought. Whatever I just said was me. So I would have to say, I don't know what you're talking about. I've always been this way or this is the way I've always am. And she's looking like, wow, that, that was like something new just happened here. And the problem is that something new that just happened here is not going to go away because the more thinking you do, the more you get back into regular life, the more you keep playing the subconscious programs, the more that behavior keeps showing up. And that's when compromises in relationships occur because behavior that you never played during the honeymoon because you stayed conscious start manifesting as default behavior. And you start thinking, introducing new people into the relationship. The subconscious programs are not you, they're other people. And then all of a sudden you realize why the relationship starts falling apart. You started with two minds, conscious minds creating heaven on earth. Then later you introduce two subconscious programs that represent other people. And now you got four minds working. And those other two uninvited guests, the subconscious minds, are the ones that are effectively uh destroy the relationship because those behaviors now um, uh, are going to, uh, you know, be compromising behaviors that take away from the honeymoon. So what I was saying just before I took a turn back was that, but if you change the subconscious programming, you'll have a honeymoon every day of your life because even if you're thinking, you'll, you'll still default to a program that's supporting your wishes so and desires. So let me ask you this, Bruce. What can we start doing in the future to start changing uh, the younger generation's subconscious mind? As you mentioned earlier, we have educational system is a farce. I yes. I never went to it. I, I actually got kicked out. I never graduated high school, never graduated university. I never fell into that type of trap. I just didn't vibe with me spiritually. I just did my own thing. I think uh, I saw you on the street with a sign, we'll work for food. Was that you? Yeah, yeah, that was me. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, that, that myth of not having an education, that falls out the window right away, doesn't it? That's right. So you see all these like educational systems, uh, even uh, society, how it's actually structured at the moment. Like you mentioned, it's really, and I mean really programming people's subconscious mind to have this supremely awful negative loop. My question to you is, what can we start doing? Obviously, it, it, we can't stop an 18-wheeler truck on a dime, right? It's going to take time to slow down the negative effects that has been uh, happening for the last, I say, 100 years or so from the Industrial Revolution. What can we start doing in the future to kind of start reprogram our subconscious mind so that when we actually do revert back to the subconscious thinking, it's not in a negative type of energy but more of a positive yeah. energy? Well, uh, Amir, the first thing is this. We have to own what we just talked about. This is reality. Okay, mm. let's own that because now we can deal with it. It's not a new age idea yeah. that we have been programmed first seven years and that the programming comes from others. Then we have to recognize, and here's the catch and the problem. This has been the problem. The mind is interfacing the world that you perceive and your biology and your behavior. So the mind is in between the world uh, and you and influences what you see and influences how you respond. So we want to change the mind. And we say, well, yeah, but we have the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And I say, yeah, the conscious mind's creative. Right away, this is a very important point, meaning the conscious mind is a creative mind, can learn in any number of ways. Listening to you and I talk on, the, on this program can change people's minds, conscious mind. It's creative. Watching a video, reading a book. I, I always love that one because I lecture to audiences that so many people out there read all these self-help books. And I go, okay, how many people read a self-help book? All the hands go up. And I go, okay, how many people after completing a self-help book, have, their lives have changed and all the hands went down? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was like this. We can educate the conscious mind, and it's very bright and smart, and it learns from any way we add data into it, from uh, the discussion we're having to just, aha, I got it. All of a sudden, that changes the conscious mind. Very creative, okay? So that means, guess what? Our conscious minds are super educated. I go, well, what about the subconscious mind? Well, this has been the problem because for years we said the two minds are part of one. So with the intention that if I educate the conscious mind, I automatically have educated the subconscious mind. It goes, ah, that's where the problem comes from. The subconscious mind is not a creative mind. It does not learn. And this mind learns. So whatever process you use to advance the awareness in your conscious mind, read the self-help book. Yeah, I'll give you a test. Guess what? Your conscious mind will get the answers right. You get 100. And I say, okay, now that you've read the book, I know you understand it. You got 100 on the test. Did your life change? And the answer is no, and I'll tell you why. Because you only affected the mind that works 5% of the time. Mm. In the process, the 95% standard, controlled, habitual mind never changed because it doesn't change that way. So since it runs your life 95% of the time, you read the self-help book, you educated the conscious mind, but your life is still exactly the same. And so now the question is, oh, you want to rewrite the subconscious. Oh, now you're talking because it operates in a different way. So how do you teach or how does the subconscious mind learn? Well, first, let me give you the two basic ways it learns because these are natural. These are in nature. This is the way it works. For seven years, as I mentioned, the brain is in a low EEG vibrational frequency called theta, which is hypnosis. So A, the first seven years of learning you didn't have to even work at it. All you had to do was just be there like a video camera with your lights on and, and you recorded everything. You learned everything just by observing it. You didn't have to work at it. It went down, it went right in. Okay, so basically hypnosis. You want to change it? You can use hypnosis. One of the uh, easiest ways of using hypnosis to change your life is to uh, buy what are called subliminal tapes, which are tapes that uh, you put earphones on and at night as you're going to bed, you put the earphones on as you're going to bed and uh, what happens is very simply this. The theta vibration, which is below the vibration of consciousness, which is alpha or focus consciousness, beta, higher vibrations, uh, theta is just below alpha, but below theta is a, the lowest one called delta. Delta is sleep. So well, here's the point. You're awake, and then you go to bed, and you go to sleep. Well, what happens as you start to go to sleep, the vibrations of the brain start to slow down. First, the beta calms down to calm consciousness, alpha, as you're calming down before going to bed. And then it goes through a period of theta on its way to delta. So there's a period as you're starting to go off into twilight reverie where the mind is in theta. 
So it says, well, guess what? If you're putting the earphones on and you put on the tapes with messages to support what you want, then basically as you're going to sleep, you're reprogramming at night by downloading data into the subconscious mind using subliminal tapes. So that's one way of changing it, okay? Number two, after seven, how does the subconscious mind learn? And the answer, primarily everything you learned after seven was based on repetition. Mm. You had to practice. You had to repeat things. You had to repeat the alphabet over and over again. The times table, how many times? Two plus, you know, two times two is four. Two times four is eight, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you had to repeat that so you could learn it for school. Guess what? Repeat it, you created a habit. That's what habituation is all about. Things that you repeat long enough, the mind will automatically make that the program so you don't have to repeat it. You, you learned how to walk. Uh, it's now a program. You don't have to think about it again. You learned how to drive a car. The moment you first got in the car, it was like you were overwhelmed with like, my God, mirrors, windows, gauges, pedals on the floor, engine noises, people outside. Ah! And now I say, today, do you even think about it? You get in the car, you put the key in, you don't even think about the driving skills at all. You're talking to your passenger and you're going down the highway. And I'm saying, you're not even paying attention. As a matter of fact, this is a true story, and I hope most of the people out there acknowledge this. I'm sure you've been driving in the car and had a passenger in the car, and you got involved in a conversation so deep that at some point you look out the window and you recognize you haven't paid attention to the road for the last five or ten minutes. Oh, that happened to me many times. Well, yeah. Well, here's the, the – and this, this is critical because it's a good uh, little story. Uh, let's say you were having a conversation with somebody and you just did that. And I would ask you, I say, Amir, tell me what was your conversation about? You really just tell me, yeah, we talked about this and this and this and this and this. And I go, great. Amir, tell me what was on the road during the five minutes that you were driving. And you go, I don't know. You know <laughs> I, I don't know what was on the road. And I go, okay, this is precisely the same story like Bill uh, not saying he behaved like his parent for this reason. Your conscious mind was busy, focused on the conversation. It remembers the conversation. But because the conscious mind was focused on the conversation, it was not driving the car. The subconscious was driving the car. Uh, don't worry. It's a million times more powerful a computer than the conscious anyway, so it's a better driver. Uh, the subconscious was driving the car. Uh, but what was the point? Your conscious mind was busy in conversation. It did not observe the behavior that happened when you were driving. That's the point. 95% of your day is just like that. And, and so um, uh, how do you want to learn something? Habituate it. But that means not a sticky note on the refrigerator. That, that's like, like a wish. Every now and then I walk by a refrigerator and go, oh, yeah, look, yeah, there's a note. Be nice or something. No big deal. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. That's not a habit. That doesn't do anything. You got to do a repetition, something you practice. And that will then lead to a point where you practice it so frequently, the mind is downloaded. Now you don't have to practice its automatic behavior. Okay, that's the second way. Uh, these take time. The subliminal and the habituation practice take a little bit of time. Now I'm going to tell you something that's exciting because uh, necessity is the mother of invention. And uh, we have a necessity to rewrite our lives right away. As I said, we're facing the sixth mass extinction. We've got to change our behavior. We have to rewrite these You just mentioned the sixth extinction. There's a new book. Uh, I think it's Elizabeth... Uh, Sartoris? Uh, let me get it right now. I I was just finishing reading it. It talks about exactly what you are just saying. We're literally at the brink of a sixth extinction. Yeah. No, it's called Elizabeth Colbert. Oh, okay. Fantastic well, is this a book. Well, that's where we are, folks, <laughs> uh, and the way out of it because it's caused by human behavior is to change human behavior. And since human behavior has been programmed for generations, uh, you want to talk about changing the program. So we were just getting into the two fundamental ways because the, con the subconscious learns by A, hypnosis, uh, B, habituation, and C. And this is the cool one, Amir. This is the great one. There are new processes called belief change modifications or energy psychology. And if anybody goes, uh, they want to go to my website, brucelipton.com, under uh, resources, uh, there's a listing of these uh, um, modalities. And what, what's important about them is this. Listen to this. It's, an, it's, it's a form of super learning where you can rewrite a subconscious belief in about five to ten minutes wow. and change your life on a dime absolutely on a dime, turn it around and rewrite it. And what is involved about this super learning is that it engages like uh, finding where the hell the record button was. <laughs> once, you, <laughs> once you could push the record button, you can then download the data directly in, just like you learned it when you were an infant without any effort at all. It just boom, goes right in. So uh, the first thing you have to do is find out, well, what, 
what part of my programs are affecting my life and where did I, what are those programs? You know, it's like my life is uh, being controlled by these programs. I wasn't conscious of when the programs went in, you know, like you were being programmed even before you were born. They were programmed during the first year, the second year, the third year. You, you have no conscious memory of that. You weren't even there. So you say, okay, Lipton, great story uh, and program. What the hell are the programs? And now here comes the fun part, Amir. This is like, okay, joy, easy. Here's what it is. 95% of conscious, by definition, your life is a printout of your subconscious programming. Mm. You don't have to go back in time and waste your time finding who said what the who and who did that behavior. That's bullshit. Excuse me, I were online. But uh, <laughs> uh, basically, it's a waste of time, and it only makes things worse because you relive the bad experiences each time. You don't have to go back in time. You have to look and say, where are you right now, and what's, what are you missing in your life? Here's how it works. Whatever comes into your life right now that comes in easy, no effort at all, just shows up. Uh, it shows up because you have a program that allows it to be there. In contrast, whatever your workout in your life that you work hard at, that you sweat at, that you struggle over, things that you really want but you're not getting there, almost inevitably it reflects that you have a program that does not support that conclusion. So all you have to do is look at your life and say, what is it, what is it that I want that I can't seem to get? And right away, you already know that you, essentially you have a program that is antagonistic to that goal. Uh, and you can then rewrite uh, the the program, the subconscious, using these uh, uh, new techniques. And, and it's most amazing because at first, uh, and I've been involved with one of them that I really love because it's the simplest and easiest and, and most, um, uh, uh, I like it the best because it has permission protocols that the other ones don't. Meaning, before you change this belief, you better check in with your system. <laughs> See, <laughs> is, this, is this good for me to do? Yeah. Uh, uh, and most of the time, it'll say, yeah, go ahead and change it. But 5% or more of the time, it, it, it says, no, don't change that. Uh, it doesn't mean don't change it forever. It means don't change it first <laughs> because many behaviors that are not very good are actually what are called compensatory behaviors that are covering up worse behaviors. So if you remove the front one and expose for you. Uh, so sometimes you, the, the subconscious and your higher self will tell you w which ones uh, are, you can change, no problem. Most of them I said you can change. And, um, and, and at first it seemed like I know it worked because it profoundly affected my own life when I first experienced it, profoundly affected every other person's life around me that experienced this psyche process. And uh, for the longest time, I, I talked with uh, Rob Williams, the developer of the process, because it, it really worked. But every, you know, it was always on the edge. That's a new agey thing. You know, is that real? What's going on? Well, I'm really, really happy to say that a neuroscientist by the name of Jeff Fannin, F-A-N-N-I-N, -N Jeff Fannin, uh, who does brain mapping. Um, it was interesting. Uh, one of the assistants that worked in his lab went to one of our psyche programs, went back to the lab and told Jeff, oh, you can change beliefs in a few minutes. And he's like, no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing this EEG brain mapping stuff for years. No, you can't. <laughs> so she, he said, look, because he learned the process, uh, uh, he said, OK, look, uh, put wires on my head. Let's uh, record my brain activity. Just do the process and we'll see what happens. Well, it blew Jeff's mind, and 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 the whole thing was it, he never saw anything like that in the EEG work he's ever done in his life. Wow. That it profoundly changed the EEG in minutes, in minutes. And EEG is like fingerprints. You can, you know, a person's EEG it characterizes that person's thinking processes. And and when changes like that occur, he said they don't, they don't change, uh, they change, but not like in minutes. Uh, he never saw anything like that at all. And he's been so taken by this that from that moment on he changed his whole direction of research and now uh, it's interesting because uh, uh, he can, he'll go to an audience for example uh, take somebody out in the audience, a volunteer uh, change, you know, go through a belief process uh, like the psyche process and have the person wired up and have the projector show the live EEG on the screen while the guy's sitting there on the stage with the wires on his head going through a belief change process. And what's most amazing, the changes are so profound that even the audience can see when the changes occur. The brain changes its function just like a, switching a gear. Boom, shifted into high gear, just changes function. So 
these belief change things uh, sound new agey, but no, there's what a does that science. look like though? Like, what's the process? The process uh, here's what the pro in the psyche process. There, there's two parts: a identifying the belief that you want to change. So let's say you're you're struggling with relationships, okay? Uh, and almost inevitably comes down to this problem because eighty to ninety percent of the people that uh, when we do belief change workshops will not test positive for this belief. I love myself. Mm. And it becomes very important because if you don't love yourself and your mind is creating a world based on your program, how can anybody else love you? If you can't love you, how can anybody else love you? It wouldn't, it wouldn't make any sense. So you will sabotage relationships uh, and then prove to yourself that I'm not lovable because that's the nature of the mind. The mind takes the programs and makes reality out of the program. So if you have a program, I'm not lovable. So uh, you say, well, uh, how about a statement? I am lovable. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then you, you want to program it. Well, you do muscle testing to find out, does your mind support that belief? So quick insight, muscle testing. The subconscious, the larger part of the brain, 90% of the brain, is the computer that controls muscle coordination and action because it requires so much computation, it's unbelievable to, to organize the muscles for movement. Uh, and so here's the point. You make a statement with your conscious mind, the creative mind, like, I love myself. The subconscious mind, upon hearing that statement, use the data in the program. And comes up with the fact, no, you don't. <laughs> ah. and, uh, and then what happens is now what? The two minds are not in harmony. The conscious mind saying, I love myself. The subconscious mind saying, the data says no. The disharmony that results when the two minds are in conflict causes a weakening of the body's muscles. And it's not just weakening of the arm muscles. It's every muscle in the body is weakened in a state of conflict between the conscious and the subconscious mind when they don't agree. So much so that you can uh, a muscle test you can do with an eye chart. <laughs> you can read a, a, a finer line uh, and then uh, you do a muscle test where you make a statement like I love myself and the program says no you don't, disharmony. Uh, the line you were reading will get fuzzy now. You won't be able to read it. You'll have to go to bigger letters because you've weakened the muscles. But you can do it by muscle testing with arms and all that. It's It's a way of just saying – what program do I have? I want to verify that my conscious and subconscious agree or they don't agree before you know working on this. So we find out uh, your subconscious does not support the belief I love myself. So you say, I want to now make the program. So I say, how do you do it? Well, part of it's an exercise, and it's very important to recognize this. Before seven, the brain hemispheres, right and left hemispheres, are working in harmony with each other. They're synchronized. It's called brain sync, hemi-sync. Um, after seven and through the rest of your life, the brain uh, shows brain dominance. So sometime during the day, your right hemisphere is more dominant. And then uh, like the tides coming in and out, later in the day, the left hemisphere is more dominant. Then later again, the right hemisphere goes back and forth. Just to give a, you know, like the differential between the two, uh, consider the right hemisphere is intellectual and the left hemisphere is emotional. Meaning sometimes during the day, you're more intellectually, uh, you know, involved with things. And then sometimes during the day, you might be more, Things so that uh, emotion will override intellect uh, uh, sometime, and then later intellect will override emotion at other times, uh, but they're not in harmony with each other. Trying to introduce a new belief into a brain where the two hemispheres are not in harmony is resisted by the brain. Mm. This is why the first seven years, the brains are uh, he the hemispheres are more in sync, and that's why children can download three languages at the same time. They, they live in a household where people are speaking three languages. Uh, a a five-year-old kid can, a four-year-old kid can learn the three languages after you're seven, eight, nine. Let's say nine years old, try and learn a new language after you're nine, and you realize, wow, it's really difficult. Yeah. And, and so what was happening? Oh, your mind was in uh, theta, and your brain was in hemi-sync. Uh, and so the exercises you can do, like it's called brain gym and part of neuro-linguistic programming, you can do exercises that cause both hemispheres of the brain to fire at the same time, which causes them to run in synchrony. And so if you're doing these exercises, which involve at some point crossing your legs and crossing your arms so that your right arm is on the left side of your body and your left on the right and vice versa with the foot, et cetera, um, these exercises engage both hemispheres of the brain. So if you have this statement, I love myself, you get into the exercise, so your brain is in hemi-sync, and then you say to yourself, I love myself, 
Well, you can feel the disharmony right away because that subconscious mind's not real in harmony with that belief because of all the programs. It's almost like a static. It's like it's just not smooth. Something's wrong when you say it. And then I say, then let it relax. And then come back and say it again. I love myself. And the second time you say it, less static, less mm -hmm. disharmony. The third time, it gets less and fourth. And so it's only taken five, six, seven minutes to do this at this point, right? And at some point you say, I love myself. And then you realize totally no resistance to anything. It's sort of like your subconscious mind is going, okay, okay, what else? You got anything else, you know? <laughs> and you can feel like, okay, it's like it, it stopped responding. Then I say, okay, did the belief change? Well, then I go back up. I do the muscle test. Now, I, this time I say I love myself. Before I said it, my arm fell because my muscles got weak because it didn't believe the statement. Mm -hmm. This time I say I love myself, and guess what? My arm is strong. And and you say, well, you change the subconscious now accepting that statement. I go, absolutely. You say, how long does that work for? I say, until you change it the next time. Mm -hmm. And that's the cool part. Why? It only takes one time to do a belief. <laughs> you don't have to rewrite it again. It doesn't wear out. It, it, once you've re rewritten it, it'll stay that way. And if you didn't like the way you made the statement, and that's the hardest part of the job, is making a statement that really uh, brings the results you're looking for. Um, uh, once you make the statement and it's in, that statement is in there and, and you can change it later if you don't like it. So you're not, uh, A, uh, involving your psychology and your beliefs with other people. It's irrelevant what happened in your history and your life. So you don't even have to go there. You just have to say, what is it you want? Create a statement, and that's the part that I said it's a little bit more difficult part because the subconscious mind I mentioned earlier is like a precocious five-year-old in its creativity. Uh, basically, it comes down to this. You have to make a statement a five-year-old can understand. <laughs> uh, What's Einstein uh, had a saying, you know, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, they're not a good teacher. Well, there you go. That's why you have to get it to go into the subconscious. It has to be at that particular level, and, and you have to be very accurate with your statement. So you say, I won't, you know, you're not making enough money. You say, I want more money. I say, fine, program. <laughs> I say, now you have a six-year-old. You just told the six-year-old, I, more, more, I want more money. Guess what? The six-year-old goes in the bedroom, finds a piggy bank, opens it up, finds some pennies, hands you three or four pennies, and say, here's more money. <laughs> and you were thinking, no, I was thinking, you know, like, oh, yeah, but you never explained that. You didn't say $100,000. Yeah. You said more. Or I want to be healthy. Uh, and I say, what's wrong with that statement? I say, you didn't say you are healthy. You say, I want to be healthy. I say, when does want actually realize itself? Uh, I'll give you an example. I program, I want to be healthy today. I come back in one year and I check my program and my program says what? I want to be healthy. Never in the one year did it ever say I am healthy. <laughs> in other words, you can't project will, want, shall, desire like that. It has to be present tense as if you have it right now which then is like sort of mentally conflicting. If you're not well, you have a disease, you have cancer, and you say, I am healthy. It's sort of like even you have to sit there and go, that sounds absurd. But the whole reality is this. What you're doing is putting a program into the mind. Once the program's installed in the mind, guess what? Now the mind has a program that says, I'm healthy. But guess what? The body is not healthy. But the function of the mind is to make the program real. Yeah. So... I say I am healthy, the mind has that program, the body is not healthy, then the function of the mind is to do everything in its power to bring health back so that it, that the body's health matches the belief statement. It was the same thing, like for example, Napoleon Hill was talking about um, the power of belief, right? You put your mind to it and you can achieve anything you want. For example, you're talking about making more money. And once you program the subconscious mind to think you've already, for example, made $100,000, your mind then, I think, opens up to new possibilities. It actually sees opportunities that you would never have seen if your mind was thinking another way. Yeah. Let me give you an example, Amir, because most people have had this experience. So this will just give you an insight into the relationship of conscious, subconscious, and creativity. It goes like this. Have you – I'll ask you, Amir, but I'm hoping everybody in the audience has similar experience. you ever sit down just a before you actually focus or read anything, something caught your attention and you actually had to look for it someplace like it was over here on the right. Did you ever have that experience? Of course. Okay. A great experience. I'll tell you what it represents. The moment you flipped open the newspaper, in that one second that you flipped open the newspaper, the subconscious scanned every word on both sides of the newspaper. That's how fast the subconscious is as a processor. Scanned every word on both sides of the paper. What happened? 
in the checking of the words, it found words that were relevant to you, your, you know, whatever is in your program or whatever your career is or wherever you were born that was personal. It found some set of words that was personal to you. Its function was look at all the data, pull out a little, oh my God, here's something that's relevant to you, bring it to your attention. So the subconscious mind sees it and then gives you a little nudge and said, there's something over here. The slowness of the conscious mind is reflected in the fact how long did it take you to find it, you see? And, and why was it relevant? Because just as you said, look, the world, you open your eyes, you see everything. If there are things out there that can help you get to a destination, but your mind isn't keyed into it, it ignores those things just like the other words on the page. It's not, these are words are not relevant to me. <laughs> but if there's something important to your destination, and what you want out of life that could lead you to where you want to go or where the mind is trying to create that program that you want to become rich. There's a key here that says, oh, you missed it with you know, your conscious mind didn't see it. It was your subconscious saw everything. If the subconscious recognizes that there's something in the field, it will attract you just like it did to the newspaper to get to focus on that. And so, in fact, many of us will find ourselves staring at something for a moment like absent minded going, what the hell am I looking for? <laughs> <laughs> and again, what it represents is available to you that was relatively connected to you. And the conscious mind was so slow that it doesn't actually understand what, why am I here? But it knows that it was, there was a reason to be there, but doesn't, doesn't understand it because it can't see it. <laughs> and that's what happens sometimes to us. But so the significance is if you put the programs in, the subconscious mind will see everything in your field instantaneously and anything in the field. And, and the important part of this is not that it just saw, uh, you know, this item, but it can understand that this item, if understood, will connect you with that item, mm. which will then take you to this other place. So it's like a chess player. It's seeing three moves down the road. The conscious mind doesn't even see the first item yet. <laughs> so the idea is, if you program the subconscious appropriately, it will lead you and direct you most effectively and efficiently to your destination more than your conscious mind could ever do because the conscious mind is not powerful or, or fast enough to uh, compute the data. And this belief change modification can be all found on, uh, on your personal website. Yeah, th there's different programs. There are a whole bunch of different varieties. And I say, which one works? I say, well, that each one works depending on your belief system. Which one is the one that, that makes you feel like, oh, that's the one? Uh, now, can this can this be done by yourself, or do you need someone to facilitate it? No, you can have you can do it by yourself, but you must first have uh, an experience of the process, so that you. So, in other words, uh, it, it, the idea is um, yes, you, you could read the book on how to fly an airplane, but I'm not getting in the airplane without you having <laughs> been in there first. <laughs> uh, and, and so, the psyche process says this is how the process works, so you can experience it. Now that you have an experience of it, you can go home. And you can do your own muscle testing belief issues and you can change your beliefs and change your life. And it works so amazingly that uh, it led to my the, the, the third book is that what has happened in my life is I went from this strange, chaotic world, which is first described in the biology of belief, to a world that I honestly have to say, Amir, if there's a heaven, I, I, I'm the guy who believes it's here right now. I, I, I don't look for an afterlife. If you want joy and love and creativity and experiences and sensation this is why you have a body <laughs> and, and it was interesting because uh, i wasn't spiritual when i started my quest uh, understanding cell biology i was a molecular biologist a cell biologist working with genes and proteins and carbohydrates and blah 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 machinery mechanism and all that when i caught on to the to the fact that uh, the cell's brain was not the nucleus, but the membrane. Yes. Uh, when I caught on to that and started to understand how it operated, I recognized that the control of the cell was from the outside environment, and each of us has a unique identifying set of receptors uh, on our cells that distinguish us from each other. This is why we can't exchange body parts, because if you put your parts in another body, the immune system will read the cell and say, this is not us, <laughs> and get rid of it. Yeah. Uh, and how do I say, well, what's us? And I say, a set of antennas protein receptors on the membrane that receive signals and so i realized at that moment oh my god the the identity is coming through these antennas but the antennas are on the outside surface of the cell the signal is coming from outside and uh what then 
uh, profoundly changed my life at that moment was like, oh, my God, I, as an identity, am not inside, I'm outside. And at that moment, not being spiritual, but now recognizing two plus two is four in the sense of mechanics and biology that, oh, my God, I must be spiritual. I'm not inside. Uh, I asked myself this amazing question, a mere simple question. I said, why have a spirit in a body? Why not just be a spirit? And the answer, this, the answer is simple, funny, ultimately profound. The answer I got came from my cells. I said, why, have, why not just be a spirit? And the cells asked me a question. They asked, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? And it hit me. I said, oh, my God, the body is a virtual reality suit. You step into the body, the body's cells and biology and mechanisms convert life experiences via the nervous system into vibrational signals so that light comes in your eye, but the brain turns it into a vibrational broadcast. Uh, taste comes into your mouth, but the taste is a vibrational frequency that is broadcast by the nervous system. Uh, and so basically I realized, yeah, my identity is picked up as a broadcast through these receptors. But my life experiences are sent back to my source. And therefore, uh, what does chocolate taste like? Well, a spirit has no cells that will take the chemistry of the chocolate, break it down into the chemical components, and then give a vibrational frequency to each of the individual components uh, so that, the, that you can identify it because uh, you need the taste receptor. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, my God, all of our experiences of sense, you know, touch, taste, vision, sound, uh, pressure, uh, emotions, all of these are the result of a biological virtual reality suit in which my identity gets into the suit and then can drive it around. And so uh, I know we're running out on time here, but I just got to add this analogy because, again, the analogy makes the story. And it goes like this. I can't go to Mars, but I sure as heck would like to know what is it like to live on Mars? But I can't send anybody out there, So, but I can send a machine. So I send a thing called the Mars rover, and you look at it, and you go, it looks like a little go-kart with a lot of fancy antennas and stuff. And I go, yeah, but here's what it is. It doesn't look like it, but it's the equivalent of a human. I said, it's got cameras to see with. It's got chemical sensors to taste with. It's got temperature sensors to read the temperature. It's got all these sensory devices that pick up information about Mars and put it and pick it up in a way that I can understand it through the what's the temperature so many degrees you know what's the chemical composition so much salt it's like oh I can understand all that and I go but here's how it works there's a guy at NASA that drives the vehicle around mm -hmm. he's not in the vehicle so he sends a signal it's picked up by an antenna with that information it moves the vehicle left right whatever go here and there and I go right and I say what else happens I say the vehicle with its sensory recording devices it's using the same antenna to send back a signal to NASA to give the data of what it sees, what it feels, what's going on. And all of a sudden I go, oh, now you got the picture? We're Earth rovers. Mm. We step into this body and move around, and the sensory responses are sent back to the same source. So my spiritual knowingness, my knowingness, my beingness of that just knowingness uh, where does it get some extra knowledge from? I say when it steps into the body. <laughs> Once it steps into the body, it's got feelings and stuff like that. And that's why I go, so I got to conclude with this. But the conclusion is simply this. Most people think you die and then your soul goes to some special place called heaven. And I would like to suggest, you know, a completely uh, different approach, a, a millennial generation approach, if I may, uh, that says all that was bullshit. <laughs> yeah. This reason is that we were born into heaven. We were born to come in here to get into this virtual reality suit, to see what life is like, to feel love and feel pain and to create a world and do all these things. And that this is our life, this is our experience. When you're in the body, you're en enhancing the spirit. This is more than the spirit can do. Chocolate, the spirit can't do. The body can do chocolate. And so basically it says, then why are we here? to create and to enjoy life. And I say, what are we creating? And I say, well, if it wasn't for the damn programs that took us off track, when you're not operating from the programs, what'd you create? Heaven. I go, yeah, that was the point. We're wasting a lifetime thinking that if you, if you, you know, follow all those religious principles, which to me are an unfortunate uh, 
it's unfortunate period um uh, a lot of that religious stuff uh is just control mechanism uh and i and you live in your conscious mind with no program what did you do you, I said, oh you fell in love and you created heaven i go that was your original intention that was the whole idea of it that was why we came here to to have these life experiences to be creative and and to 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 sail the south sea and know what that's like and do all these different things so we've wasted a lot of life yeah. wasted a lot of life living other people's programs destroying the environment in the process destroying ourselves leaving the millennials a, a view of the world that says holy crap what's here i can't even get started in this world and it's all falling apart already and i go Here's the most important thing that millennials have to know, and it goes simply like this. The world can only maintain itself for as long, for as, long as a large number of people hold on to the existing system. But right at this moment, the millennials constitute 50% or so of the population. And I go, why is that relevant? Because they're not holding on to the system. The system can fall anytime the millennials put their stuff together and decide it's time for them to make policy. Meaning, you could use this government and vote out all the crap heads that are in there right now and put in people that relate to you. But most millennials are unfortunately caught in a situation that, poor me, I don't have a job. I can't make money. I can't afford to all the world's against me. And I'm going, wow, you guys are sitting there with all this potential. It's only potential. You come together. You put your vote in a block. And you change the whole world. And this is what is the evolution is all about. Because the millennial generation are not a local generation. They're a global generation. They have the development of the nervous system called the Internet. That is what prevented the evolution of humanity up until this point because everyone was an individual. But now everybody is connected. And that means we're moving in the next evolution. And the evolution is human is the equivalent of a cell in the body of a superorganism called humanity. And and right now, humanity is suffering from autoimmune disease. The cells are killing each other. Well, the autoimmune disease kills. It's so, autoimmune disease in biology means self-destruction. Yeah, we, we're undergoing self-destruction. But it's really the old people that are holding on to the control with their old beliefs, their old uh, what's in it for me, and it's a Darwinian world, survival of the fittest. Screw you. I'm fitter than you. I get to have everything, and I can have $60 billion, and you can have nothing, and that's fair. Uh, that's old world belief. That's That just is killing us, and the millennials are not buying into it. Millennials are connected. The millennials have a vision of a global world with a global intent to create the garden and to live in that garden. The technologies to take us from the piece of crap that we've created into the garden is what will be the boon for the millennial generation. We will create all new industries to return the earth back into a garden, and it will not be the older people that will be doing this at all. It is the millennial generation. So. Well, most millennials perceive themselves as being lost in the system. It's like, no, no, you don't even see it. In a very short time, you so outnumber the other ones that when you decide to enact a control, it will be your world. And that's my message for uh, the people out there is that we're moving into a global world, which means that what happens on my side of the world impacts and alters people on the other side of the world. Therefore, I have to understand how my life could create harmony and their lives will create harmony. And when 7 billion people create harmony, the planet will become heaven on earth. And that's my, uh, my wish and my, my future vision. And I, I hope that happens, Amir. I love it. I concur. Uh, what a great way to end the show, uh, uh, Bruce. Uh, where can people find all the information about you? BruceLipton.com. There's an now we're on phone apps too, so iPod, iPad, phones were were available. We we got younger, old guy like me. <laughs> so, some of us old guys, uh, you know, think differently. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're all doing our part. Uh, you mentioned the min millennials. It just we just got to start stepping up and uh, you know start working to, start working together as 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 one. That's it. It's just change the vision of I'm a victim to change to the to the vision. I am the master. Mm. I can control my life. Well, yeah, let's get rid of that programming. Let's get these red pills down and, and let's move out because uh, this old program is death and um, there's life in front of us.
Awesome. Well, Dr. Uh, Bruce Lipton, I want to thank you so much for coming on the Optimal Health Show. Really, I want to thank you. And to everyone out there, really taking the message that we, we were talking about today, you know, changing your subconscious mind, becoming the driver of your body and not living your day from a in a zombie state, as I like to call it, but really awakening and, and living the heaven on earth that is uh, earth itself. I agree with that one, Amir, and I support that. And I want to also acknowledge the audience as well, because you are the culture of creatives. If you're listening to this program, you're already looking outside the box. And I want to encourage you to continue doing that because the answers are not in the box. And uh, Amir's show and your community uh, are, are the people that will make a difference. And I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay, thanks a million. Y'all come back now. Cheers. If you like Succeed with Knowledge, subscribe and give us a thumbs up. And thanks a million. Cheers.